introduce uh, Professor Dipali Sashital from the BDMB department right here at Iowa State. And she uh, got her um, bachelor's degree in chemistry and biochemistry at the University of Michigan. And then she got her PhD at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where some of the finest faculty in our old department got their PhDs. <laughs> and then she went on and did a postdoc uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, where also some other of the finest faculty in our department got PhDs for postdoc. And uh, she went to Jennifer Doudna's lab there, where she was actually a Damon Runyon postdoctoral fellow. I going to tell a little story. So uh, before she got there, I went and did a sort of a little mini sabbatical in Jennifer Doudna's lab. Uh, uh, and I was thinking to try to learn RNA structure techniques, and I learned a lot there, actually. And I was just thinking, man, Jennifer Dowden is so good. If she could, she's done this stuff with translation factors and RNA and viruses, but if she could find something really appropriate, she could maybe win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> and then, right as I was leaving, I heard her talking to somebody about these things called CRISPRs and stuff, and it was like, what are, What's, uh, what's that? Oh, it's uh, some bacterial resistant to oh, bacterial virus. So then I left. <laughs> <laughs> and so you might know now that, um, well, first I have to finish a little bit here. Uh, so um, uh, Dr. Sashital then did a, a short postdoc in Jamie Williamson's lab at the Scripps Institute, and then she came here to the biochemistry department in January of 2014, so exactly four years ago. And, um, but, uh, so you've, so I think Jennifer Doudna probably will get a Nobel Prize because CRISPR-Cas is being used, as many of you know, for um, as a genetic engineering or a genome engineering tool in every kind of organism. But that's, we hear a little bit about that today. What you're going to really hear about is something that I think biologically is even more fascinating, and that's how it works in its natural setting and how the bacteria can acquire one specific immunity to different types of viruses or plasmids or other invading DNAs. So um, I believe that's what you'll be talking about. And I think that's appropriate for plant pathology, how organisms defend themselves against diseases. So that's why I thought she'd be a good speaker. So with that, Hi. Thanks a lot, Alan, for inviting me. It's always fun to come and visit another department on campus. Uh, and actually, the weather wasn't so bad for walking across campus today, so that was good. Um, so, as Alan mentioned, I'm in the Department of Biochemistry, Biophysics, and Molecular Biology. Uh, my lab is located in the Molecular Biology Building, if anyone would like to come visit. Um, my, our department is, uh, you know, these three subjects, and my talk will be quite oriented towards those three subjects today, so um, I hope that it'll be maybe a little bit of a change of pace from uh, your normal seminar series. Uh, so, as Alan mentioned, my lab studies mainly CRISPR-Cas systems. We do um, kind of look at things from both the technological side, so of course, uh, I'm sure, as Alan mentioned, you're all aware that uh, CRISPR-Cas9 has been really um, well adapted for genome editing tools, and we have some projects related to that. But today I'm going to talk um, about the main project in our lab, which is really more related to how these uh, CRISPR-Cas systems um, function in their endogenous roles, which is as an immune system for uh, bacteria and archaea. Uh, and I think this can be kind of a weird topic, as Alan mentioned. Um, we normally think about immune systems defending us from bacteria, uh, and not for about bacteria having immune systems against pathogens that would invade them. But of course, all living organisms on Earth are subject to infection. There, if there's a living cell, there will be some type of opportunistic pathogen that's going to try and take advantage of it. And so uh, bacteria are, of course, subject to infection by viruses. These are, of course, the first viruses that were ever um, discovered, bacteriophages, which are shown here. They were discovered about 100 years ago. Um, and this is an EM image that with false color uh, added to it. You can see that the bacteriophages are shown here in green. Uh, and they're invading um, the bacteria by in injecting their DNA genomes into the bacteria. And this type of infection will, uh, in some cases, eventually lead to that bacterial cell lysing and, and dying. So this is something that bacteria need to protect themselves against. They need to be able to defend themselves 
uh, from this type of infection that can not only uh, affect one cell, but can uh, eventually affect the entire population of cells. So I think when we think about immunity in bacterial cells, one thing that's important, important to keep in mind is that these are single cell organisms. Uh, they don't necessarily need to protect themselves so much as they need to protect the population. Um, and this type of interaction that's shown here is actually uh, by far and away the most abundant infection interaction uh, that occurs uh, on Earth. It's estimated that there's something like 10 to the 29th infections of um, bacteriophages uh, infecting bacteria that occur every single day. Uh, and in the ocean, it's uh, estimated that something like 40% of the bacteria, and there's a huge amount of bacteria in the ocean, is killed off every day uh, by bacteriophage infection. So this is something that's occurring all the time. It's occurring in your body right now, in your microbiome. Uh, it's a really, really important interaction. And it's really important for us to understand how bacteria <coughs> can defend themselves against this. So, um, a lot of the mechanisms that we've known about for many years that uh, allow bacteria to be defended are fairly rudimentary. They are what we would kind of um, uh, call innate immune immunity. So um, they're more non-specific. There are things that would sort of defend against any foreign uh, invader that's coming into the cell. But about 11 years ago now, um, it was discovered that bacteria actually have much more complex and sophisticated immune systems that are more akin to what we would consider adaptive immunity. So in our own adaptive immune systems, I would consider um, two main hallmarks to make them adaptive. One is that our adaptive immune systems are specific. So we develop antibodies, we develop T cells that are specific against a specific <coughs> pathogen. They can detect specific antigens and defend against those pathogens. The second is that um, our uh, adaptive immune system provides molecular memory. So we have memories of prior infections. If you get sick and then you are infected with the same virus again a few months later after you've gotten better, you can um, fend off that virus uh, very well because you've already <coughs> developed your antibodies against them. And that's, the, of course, the basis for vaccination. So similarly, uh, adaptive immunity in bacteria and archaea have to also provide specificity and molecular memory. And the CRISPR-Cas system does both. So what is this system? So a CRISPR array is this signature um, DNA locus that's found <coughs> within the host genome. It has kind of an unusual architecture. It's made up of several repeating sequences. So these are short uh, repeats that are somewhere around 30 base pairs in length. And they're shown here as black diamonds. <coughs> so these are identical sequences that uh, reoccur many times. And these are separated by these uh, unique sequences that are shown as different colored squares that we call spacer sequences. And these are also usually um, on the order of 25 to 35 base pairs in length. So these unique spacer sequences are actually sort of the business end of the CRISPR. These are the important parts of the CRISPR. And the reason for that is that these are pieces of DNA that have been taken up from viral invaders or from some foreign piece of genetic material. So here you can see that we have a green spacer. This is a piece of DNA that was taken from this green bacteriophage. We have an orange spacer. This is a, a short piece of DNA that was taken up from this orange bacteriophage. And so um, early on, people were able to recognize that spacers within CRISPR arrays are actually extra chromosomal DNA. And other bioinformaticists were able to um, identify that there's always a number of different genes that are associated with these CRISPR arrays. These are what we call CRISPR-associated or Cas genes. So together, the CRISPR and the Cas opera make up a CRISPR-Cas system. That's where that name comes from. So the first um, example of this CRISPR-Cas system being an immune system was really an elegant set of experiments that I'm going to very briefly describe. So what the researchers did was they took phages uh, against which the bacteria already had, were infecting this bacterium that already has those spacers present. And what we find is that uh, the phages are um, not able to infect these bacteria. So the bacteria are resistant to these phages. But then if you take another phage, now a red phage, 
to a <coughs> net stage, the bacterium doesn't already contain a spacer, this uh, phage is able to infect the bacteria, uh, and it is able to kill off the bacteria. But eventually, you might start to get some bacteria that are, that are resistant to this phage, and if you then look at the CRISPR array, what you find is that there's a new spacer that's been taken up in the CRISPR array. And this is a red spacer, so this spacer came from this new bacteria phage. And once the bacteria has this red spacer, now the bacteria is resistant to this red bacteria phage. So this shows the two hallmarks of the adapt uh, of, that makes an adaptive immune system. One is that the red spacer is providing specificity against the red bacteria phage, just as the green spacer provided specificity against the green phage and the orange against the orange phage. The other is that the CRISPR-Cas system provides molecular memories of prior infections. So each of these spacers was derived during or was integrated during an infection event, and that provides the, um, the vaccination for following um, infections by the same bacteria phage. All right, so how does this actually work? Uh, it's not just that there's a spacer there and suddenly you're, uh, you're immune, there are actually molecular mechanisms underlying this process. So I just described to you this first um, step, which we call adaptation. This is the step in which the CRISPR or the Cas proteins are able <coughs> to recognize that there is a foreign DNA present, take a short snippet of that DNA, mm -hmm. and insert it as a new spacer in the CRISPR array. And I'm gonna talk about this uh, mechanism much, uh, in much more detail later on in my talk. So the CRISPR has to actually be transcribed for it to do anything. RNA is always more important than DNA, <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, so it's first transcribed as a long term CRISPR RNA, which is then cleaved into individual, what we call mature CRISPR RNAs. And each of these, you'll notice, contains one spacer sequence. Mm -hmm. What that means is that each of these CRISPR RNAs is complementary to some region of the bacteriophage from which the spacer was derived. So these CRISPR RNAs can then associate with Cas proteins to form um, something that I'm gonna call a surveillance complex. Uh, this is also sometimes called an effector complex. The reason why I'm calling it a surveillance complex is because the job of this protein RNA complex is to survey the cell and search for that one region of the bacteriophage genome that's complementary to the CRISPR RNA. So it's gonna search all of the DNA in the cell, find that one region, unwind the DNA and then base pair or form base pairs between the CRISPR RNA and the complementary strand of the DNA. And then once this target is bound, it can be degraded. And that degradation is really what's going to lead to the neutralization of the infection. If there's no phage DNA, then there's no infection. Uh, and the way that this can occur is um, often variable. So for those of you who are familiar with Cas9, you probably know that within the Cas9 protein are nucleates domains, so the Cas9, once it binds, can cleave the DNA itself. Other Cas systems uh, require a separate endonuclease that can be recruited, and that can go on and degrade the DNA. So there's a lot of diversity in CRISPR-Cas systems, which I'll talk about in a couple slides. So in the first part of my talk, I wanna focus really on this um, very important but pretty difficult step of the surveillance complex searching for the target. So what the surveillance complex has to accomplish during this step is that it has to locate the target, unwind the double-stranded DNA, and it does this in an ATP-independent manner. So it's somehow, um, without the external energy of ATP hydrolysis, uh, able to unwind a fairly long stretch of DNA, somewhere between 20 and 32 base pairs in length, uh, and then form the RNA-DNA duplex between the CRISPR RNA and the complementary strand of the target. So why is this such a daunting task? Because there's so much DNA in any cell, so it's still astonishing to me that Cas9 even works in eukaryotic cells considering how much DNA there is, but even in a bacterial cell, there's millions of base pairs, because it's not just the phage DNA that's present in the cell, there's also the bacterial genome. And the bacterial genome, in the case of E. coli, is four and a half million base pairs. So somehow, in an efficient manner, in a timely manner, timely enough that it can, uh, can fight off the infection before the cells start to lyse, 
the uh, CAS surveillance complex has to find that target and elicit the immune response. So this is a question that I've been interested in for a long time, since I was a, a postdoc in Jennifer Doudna's lab. Um, and we've been really trying to search for uh, how is this accomplished in an efficient manner? So does the CAS endonuclear, or does the CAS surveillance complex just go around the DNA, unwinding it willy-nilly, looking for complementarity between the RNA and the DNA, or does it do it in a more targeted manner? What's the smartest way to go around about this? So uh, before I talk about that a little bit more, I need to describe to you in a little bit more detail how the surveillance complex actually binds to the double-stranded DNA. So this is a little bit more of a detailed picture of how that works. So again, we have our uh, surveillance complex in blue. It's bound to a CRISPR RNA uh, that has a red spacer. And this is binding to the target region. And now we're showing this as a double-stranded DNA so you can see how that actually works. So you have a complementary strand of the double-stranded DNA. This is gonna form a hybrid with the RNA. And then you have a non-complement or a non-target strand that's gonna be displaced. So this forms what we call an R loop, which is similar to the type of R loop that would form uh, by the transcription complex. Um, so this region of the, tar of the um, bacteriophage genome from which the spacer is derived, which is also the target, is called the protospacer. So that's the original sequence that was taken up by the bacteria into the CRISPR. And uh, aside from that complementary region, there's actually another very important region of the target, and that's just adjacent to the complementary region. It's called the protospacer adjacent motif. So it's a conserved sequence that's always located next to the protospacer. Uh, we call it a PAM for short. So that means that when the CRISPR system takes up a new uh, spacer from the protospacer, it has to be a region that's next to one of these PAM sequences. And then PAM recognition is critical for target binding by the surveillance complex. So when the surveillance complex binds to this target, it can only do that if there is a PAM present. If this sequence is mutated, it's gonna make it much more difficult for the complex to bind to the target. So this paper um, down here was really a seminal paper that showed that mutations that arise in bacteriophages that have escaped from the CRISPR immune system often arise in this PAM motif. So you can have a single mutation just in the PAM that renders the CRISPR system inactive against the bacteriophage. So um, if you ask questions about it later, that does make it sound like the CRISPR system is not very, um, not very useful. Uh, I could talk about that in the question and answer session, but I'm not gonna talk about it today. All right, so when I was a postdoc in Jennifer's lab, um, we um, presented a model in a paper that I published um, describing how the PAM motif might be used by the surveillance complex to search for targets. So if every target has a PAM next to it, that means that the uh, surveillance complex can kind of simplify its job by searching first for PAM motifs and then looking to see if there's complementarity in the adjacent region. So that's gonna simplifi simplify your search by about uh, 164, or uh, make 164 the number of uh, positions that you have to search for, because there's 64 possible three nucleotide motifs. <coughs> so assuming that those uh, three nucleotide motifs are evenly distributed throughout your genome, you're, you're making your life a lot, sim a lot more simple. Um, and then, if you also consider that you don't have to unwind the whole region unless there's complementarity, it becomes even simpler. So I really, uh, this is a model, so we don't have, you know, super direct evidence for it. There were a couple papers um, using a more low resolution single molecule. Uh, oh, before I say that, I just want to point out, for those of you who've used Cas9 before, you've probably heard of um, the PAM motif before. Uh, so just a brief tutorial on how Cas9 works. You have that single protein, Cas9, that can both bind to targets as long as it's um, programmed with the correct guide RNA, and it can cleave the targets, creating a double-strand break. And if you do this in eukaryotic cells, once this break is um, introduced, the uh, endogenous repair mechanisms, DNA repair mechanisms, 
will lead to changes in the DNA. And that's how we're able to edit DNA using Cas9. For those of you who have used Cas9 before, you know that although we say you can target virtually any sequence, you can't really target any sequence because the sequence has to have a PAM, a correct PAM sequence next to it. So when you choose your gene of interest, you have to very precisely choose the guy or the region that you're going to target um, containing a PAM sequence. And the reason for that is because Cas9 cannot bind to targets that don't have correct PAM. All right, so Cas9, as I mentioned, is a single polypeptide. Um, and I also mentioned that Cas genes are highly diverse. And this is what we would actually expect, given that these are uh, you know, immune systems that are going to be subject to um, significant evolutionary pressures. Uh, and as a result, there's a, a lot of different types of uh, CRISPR Cas systems. There's a lot of diversity in the CRISPRs themselves and the repeat sequences. Um, and we've classify them into several different classes and types and subtypes. I'm not going to really go into that much. What I really want to point out here is that class one and class two systems differ uh, in the composition of their, in, of their surveillance complexes. So the surveillance complexes of the type one, or sorry, the class one systems are multi-protein complexes, whereas the um, surveillance complexes of class two are a single polypeptide, and that's what makes them so great for genome, engine, uh, for genome editing. It's just a two-component system with the protein and the RNA. Uh, unfortunately, uh, these systems are actually not very prevalent in nature, and therefore, from an immune system point of view, in my opinion, are less interesting to study. Whereas the type 1 systems are actually the most prevalent um, in all bacteria, that, at least that have been sequenced to date. So in my lab, when we study the immune system, we mainly focus on these type 1 systems. And you can see that the uh, surveillance complex is going to be a lot more complicated. So it has uh, five different proteins, which are shown here. And this forms a very large 405 kilodalton RNA protein complex called Cascade. So I have a schematic of Cascade on the left here. You can see that the proteins are present in an unequal stoichiometry. Uh, and you can also see a crystal structure on the right, where you have six of these uh, Cas7 subunits along the backbone that um, kind of shields the blue RNA, and the RNA is bound to the magenta DNA. At the very bottom here, you can see that PAM sequence in yellow, and that is interacting with this green subunit, CSC1. So CSC1 recognizes the PAM, that's gonna be important for a little bit later, um, and the Cas7 subunits also interact with the DNA uh, at these last two positions down here. All right. So, as I mentioned, I've been interested for a long time in understanding how Cascade binds to, or finds and binds its targets. First of all, how does it locate the target? Secondly, how does it unwind the DNA when it arrives at the target? So, we could imagine that there's two different ways in which really any DNA binding protein might search DNA. One is what we might call a one-dimensional search, which is essentially sliding along the DNA. So you're not letting go of the DNA, you're just kind of translocating along it and looking for the sequence that you're interested in. This, in this case, those might be PAM sequences. So in that case, Cascade may slide between PAMs and pause at each PAM looking for complementarity until it finds the PAM that's actually next to the target sequence. Another possibility is that instead of sliding along the DNA, Cascade may hop around the DNA in what we would call a three-dimensional search. So in this case, it's actually dissociating for the, from the DNA and reassociating at another position. So in that case, uh, it may reassociate with the DNA at any non-specific site, but only pause if it's at a PAM site. If it's at a non-PAM site, it may dissociate very quickly until it finally gets to the target site. So we wanted to come up with a method that would allow us to really look at this and dissect this and determine how does Cascade search DNA? How does it find PAMs and then how does it unwind the DNA? So um, this is the work of a really, really awesome graduate student, Chao Yu Shui, who <coughs> just graduated and, and left for a postdoc. Um, he developed a system that was actually very difficult to develop, to develop. I'm not going to talk about it, uh, where he could introduce fluorescent labels at site-specific positions in Cascade. So Cascade is 
a large complex, it's not super easy to introduce um, a single label at a single position in it. But he was able to do that, so he was able to generate a cascade complex that contains a fluorophore uh, in one of the subunits, Cas5e. Um, and then he was also able to make a DNA that has another fluorophore, and that's on um, a DNA that's immobilized on a slide, on a quartz slide. So this uh, DNA is basically um, kind of stuck onto the slide, and what we can do is flow cascade with the other label on it onto that slide and allow cascade to bind to the DNA. So if you're familiar with FRET, you know that if you have um, two different fluorophores that are sort of FRET compatible with one another, what will happen is if you uh, excite one of the fluorophores, when they're when the two fluorophores are far apart from each other, you'll only see signal from the excited fluorophore. But when the two fluorophores are close together, as would be the case when cascade is bound, then you get a transfer of energy from the excited fluorophore to the unexcited fluorophore. And now you'll see signal from the, what we call acceptor fluorophore. So in this case, the green fluorophore, the side three, is the donor, and the red fluorophore is the acceptor. And using a specialized type of microscope, a, a turf microscope, we can actually visualize individual molecules of cascade binding to individual molecules of DNA. And if we visualize this over a time scale where we're taking uh, short pictures, um, sort of a movie of these, um, of these fluorescent events, we can monitor when cascade actually binds to the DNA. So how does that work? So in this case, we start out with a high donor fluorescence intensity. That's because the donor is the one that we're exciting. We see a low acceptor fluorescence intensity. That's because the cascade is not bound to the DNA. But then eventually, we see this precipitous drop in the donor intensity and this increase in the acceptor intensity. And what has happened here is now the donor and the acceptor are in close proximity, and you have fret occurring, so we can calculate the fret efficiency based on these intensities. And you can see in this case that this fret intensity, or that this fret signal is very long lasting. It lasts for um, the entirety of the movie that we took, in fact, until the fluorophores photo bleached. And what that means is that cascade is bound to the target and it's not letting go of the target. And that's what we expect when cascade is bound uh, to its actual target. So that's cool. So now we've developed a system where we can watch individual molecules of uh, cascade binding to DNA. But we weren't really interested in looking at this type of interaction, which is very well characterized. We know what happens when it binds to the target. But what happens when it binds to regions of DNA that don't have a target, right? So you know, one of the criticisms of the PAM scanning model is that um, there's lots of PAMs. As I mentioned earlier, it does simplify the search but there's still a lot of PAMs, and that still needs to be an efficient process. So how, how does it actually do that? So what we did was we created three different target sequences, three different substrates that lack a complementary region, so there's no protospacer in these targets, but there are PAMs. So there are these three base pair motifs that Cascade is searching for while looking for targets. So in the first case, we actually don't have any PAMs or target. This is essentially a, a DNA that should be, the cascade should be blind to, we would think, unless it has a non-specific binding activity. Then we have a target with one PAM, and finally one with three PAMs. And what we expect to see is that kit that has no PAMs in it, as it turns out. Um, but we can, and what we see is that these very, very short FRET events are essentially one frame each. So one frame of the camera that we're using, and our frame rate is 100 milliseconds per frame. So these types of events are occurring on a time scale of probably less than 100 milliseconds. So very, very quick sampling of cascade on the DNA. But you'll see as we increase the number of PAMs that now we start to see longer events, and we start to see more longer events as there are more PAMs. Um, I'm not going to talk about the FRET intensity here, but based on the intensity, we can also tell where on the DNA cascade is binding. And you can see here that the FRET intensities are much more variable, and that's because there's three different PAMs, so it's binding 
uh, more variably along um, all of these pans. All right, so the data that I'm showing you here is all for one molecule each. We can't just look at one molecule and say, we've, we've done it, we figured it out. You have to actually um, you know, analyze your data in aggregate. So we actually collect data for thousands of molecules, and then we can measure essentially how long these FRED events occur. Um, and we can uh, plot graphs that look like this. These are fit to double exponential decay curves, which essentially have two time components to them. The first time component is for fast events. So these are these really short blips that we see, uh, especially for the zero pan target. And that time component, you can see, is pretty similar for all three of the targets. All of them are around 100 milliseconds, which, as I mentioned, is really the, the time, the limit of our time resolution for this experiment. So we're guessing that this is actually slightly an overestimation of, of those fast events. We attribute this to non-specific binding because we see it for the zero to, um, PAM target, uh, but also because it's similar for all three of the targets. So it doesn't seem like the number of PAMs has much of an effect on these shorter binding or these quick binding events. And then the second time component is related to slower events. And in this case, you can see that we see a, an increase in uh, the amount of time that Cascade is dwelling depending on how many PAMs are present. So the more PAMs that are present, the longer Cascade remains bound to the DNA. So we think that these, uh, this time component is describing the PAM-dependent uh, events, where Cascade is sticking on a PAM and trying to look at the adjacent region. And um, I just want to point out that we can also see that the number of these um, slow events is actually quite low. So this amplitude constant kind of tells us uh, what percentage of events actually were the slow versus the fast events. And the slow events were ver a very small percentage for the zero PAM, um, for the zero PAM target. So just to kind of convince you uh, that, that that really is a PAM dependent um, event. All right, so we now know that Cascade can bind to DNA in a non-specific manner or in a PAM dependent manner. So next we wanted to see whether we could identify regions of Cascade that are important for these two types of binding. So we identified three regions. One is uh, this lysine-rich loop in cas uh, two Cas7 subunits on the backbone of cas uh, Cascade. Um, this is known to interact with the backbone of um, the DNA beyond where the target site is. So it's already known that th these loops make nonspecific contacts with DNA. We thought it might be important for that nonspecific binding interaction. This glycine is important for PAM recognition, so we thought that might be important for the PAM-dependent scanning. And then finally, we also identified these two, uh, this other lysine-rich um, beta hairpin in the CSC1 subunit, which we thought might be important for positioning DNA uh, to be recognized or to uh, have PAM recognition by CSC1. So we made mutations in all of these regions. Um, actually, these mutations completely killed binding in our SF FRED assay, which we think means that these um, that this motif is extremely important for that non-specific binding activity. Um, if we get rid of these, we basically lose all binding. But the other two mutations, we could still see binding, but now we only really see those fast events. So this is what the, um, what the very similar to the previous curves uh, look like, but with a one PAM target. And you'll see that those actually look very similar to wild type cascade with a zero PAM target. So now it looks like we've basically lost our um, PAM dependent binding mode. So if we mutate either, of course, the PAM recognition motif like we would expect, but also this lysine rich region, we lose the PAM dependent binding mode, but retain the non specific binding mode. And so you can see again that the T2 component of the, uh, of the slow um, time component is very similar for the um, target with no PAMs versus these two mutants. All right, so finally, we took uh, those three motifs and we modeled how DNA might bind if it were to contact all of those motifs. And what we found is that DNA actually has to be bound in a slightly bent um, way in order to accommodate all of those interactions if CSC1 is in the confirmation that we observe in the structure of cascade without DNA bound. 
I think this is interesting because DNA bending is thought to be involved in how Cascade can unwind DNA en route to um, our loop formation. But it's unlikely that Cascade initially engages the DNA in this bent mode. So we were curious about how might Cascade bind to DNA if it's in a linear conformation. And so we were able to um, just linearize the DNA just using some um, molecular modeling. And when we did that, we found that in order to continue to accommodate all these conformation or all these interactions, CSC1 has to kind of open up into this partially open conformation. So what we think is that CSC1 conformational changes may be important for uh, destabilizing the DNA duplex and helping to unwind the DNA during target uh, binding. And that this is really um, something that's only achieved when a correct PAM is, is present. So you only have DNA unwinding initiated when Cascade encounters a correct PAM. All right, so to summarize this section, um, what we found is that indeed Cascade searches DNA by a three-dimensional uh, search mechanism where it kind of hops around the DNA. Um, it can randomly sample non-specific regions which don't contain PAM sequences using the lysine-rich uh, regions of both CSC1 and CAS7. Uh, it rapidly dissociates um, on the order of less than 100 milliseconds. When it encounters a PAM, it dwells at that PAM, um, and it can initiate uh, the interrogation of the adjacent DNA by bending the DNA and destabilizing the duplex. Um, that type of interaction lasts for around one second, uh, but then it will dissociate in the absence of any complementarity in the adjacent region. And then finally, once it reaches the correct target, then it will fully uh, bend the DNA, unwind the DNA, and form that RNA-DNA duplex. And in that case, the energy of the RNA-DNA du duplex um, formation is not only going to drive DNA unwinding, but also keep the uh, cascade complex at that position. All right, so um, in my last 15 minutes or so, I want to talk about adaptation. And this is kind of a new story from our lab that I'm pretty excited about. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that adaptation is the process of making new molecular memories. Uh, this is an extremely, this is the pinnacle of uh, what's cool about um, CRISPR-Cas systems, but also uh, the most important part of the CRISPR-Cas system, uh, because without these memories, um, you're not going to have any of the downstream stuff. Okay, so how does this step actually work? Uh, how do you get a new CRISPR, you don't, you don't just get a new spacer, but you also get a new repeat. How does that work? Um, so the molecular mechanism of this is actually kind of cool. Uh, so the CRISPR array also contains the sequence that we call the leader, which contains the promoter, and also contains uh, fairly conserved regions, especially at the junction of the leader and the first repeat. And that's, of course, where the new spacer is going to be integrated. The substrate for this integration is what I'm going to call a pre-spacer. This substrate has to have free three prime hydroxyls on each end of the double-stranded DNA. And this process occurs through two transesterification reactions. So one of these transesterification reactions occurs through the attack of the three prime hydroxyl at the uh, phosphate group uh, at the leader repeat junction. One end of the spacer uh, attached to the five prime end of the first repeat. Then you have another transesterification reaction where the second um, free three prime hydroxyl attacks at the uh, other end of the repeat, the spacer end of the repeat on the other strand. And what that results in is you have now your pre-spacer attached to either strand of the repeat, but the, the repeats, the two strands of the repeats are on either side of the spacer. So that's how a new repeat is created, it's actually from the old repeat. So this is a gapped intermediate which can be repaired by uh, just a general DNA repair process, DNA polymerase 1 and ligase most likely. So this is how you're able to get a new spacer with a new repeat at the um, 5 prime end of the CRISPR. And it's important that it's at the 5 prime end because you want the most recent spacer acquired to be the first one that's expressed. That's probably going to be the most urgently needed. All right, so I talked earlier about the diversity of the surveillance complexes 
but the adaptation machinery is actually much less diverse in terms of the machinery that's involved. So there's two proteins, Cas1 and Cas2, which are pretty much universally conserved in all CRISPR-Cas systems. And these are the proteins that are um, responsible for integration of spacers. I also want to point out here that there's another protein, Cas4, that's found in a lot of these different um, CRISPR-Cas types. This is considered to be a core Cas protein family. Uh, it's found in something like seven or eight different subtypes of CRISPR-Cas systems. However, its role remains quite mysterious, which is quite surprising because it's been known, uh, this protein has been known since the discovery of Cas proteins in the first place. Uh, and I'm going to focus about, on Cas4 uh, in today's talk. Before I do that, I just want to point out this is what the Cas1-2 complex looks like. So the Cas1 and 2 proteins form this very large complex with um, two Cas1 dimers that sandwich a Cas2 dimer. And this very beautiful structure that came out uh, late last year shows the Cas1-2 complex following full site integration uh, on both ends of um, the pre-spacer down here. All right, so I think um, I've, I've demonstrated to you that we know a lot about how spacer integration works, but there's still a lot of major questions o um, open in the field of adaptation. So first of all, how are the pre-spacers formed and how are they processed? So there's a lot of ideas about how pre-spacers might be formed. One idea is that they may be products of DNA repair, such as RexBCD products. Another idea is that they may be products of interference, of CRISPR interference. Uh, that, of course, presupposes that you already have a spacer against the bacteriophage genome. But in either case, these products are probably going to be fairly long and need to be trimmed down to the size of a spacer prior to integration. So how are those types of DNAs that could potentially be pre-spacers processed? Um, how is the fidelity of spacer integration maintained? So there's a lot of important um, specificity that has to be um, somehow carried out by the adaptation complex. First of all, you need integration to only occur at the leading edge of the CRISPR. You don't want it to occur somewhere else in the genome, which could be quite bad, but you also don't really want it to occur somewhere else in the CRISPR array. For the reason that I mentioned earlier, the first um, spacer is gonna be the most highly expressed, most likely. How is the spacer length maintained? So spacer length is gonna be important for um, things like when it's forming a complex with the surveillance complex machinery. And then finally, how is the space orientation dictated? Space orientation is exceptionally important because you need the PAM end to be oriented on the right side such that the CRISPR RNA will have the correct orientation when it's targeting um, the, the target. So the PAM has to be on whichever side uh, is correct depending on what the CAS um, surveillance complex needs. And then, in my opinion, one of the most important questions is what does Cas4 do? <coughs> so Cas4 is always found along with Cas1 and 2. This kind of implicates it in adaptation. Um, it's also been implicated in adaptation in type 1a systems where if you knock it out, uh, it has pretty strong detrimental effects on adaptation. And as I mentioned earlier, I think it's probably the most mysterious Cas genes aside from one of some of the more recently discovered ones. But those are recently discovered. Cas4 we've known about for 11 or 12 years, and we still don't know what it does. So um, another outstanding graduate student in my lab, Hyun Lee, has been working on this project. She's been uh, looking at the type 1c system in a bacterium called Bac Bacillus pallidurans, uh, and specifically looking at the adaptation to set in this, uh, this Cas opera. So what she did to start off with was she took the three adaptation proteins, Cas4, Cas1, and Cas2. She took them sort of from their native context in the operon and then put them into a plasmid uh, under control of a single promoter for heterologous expression in E. coli. And then um, this had a his tag on it so we can do affinity purification of Cas4 using nickel NTA column. And when she did that, she found that Cas4 didn't just come down by itself, but it actually also co-purified with Cas1, really beautifully, actually. You can see uh, perfect um, stoichiometry between these. Uh, looks like there's about twice as much Cas1 as Cas4. Um, I'll also note that there's no Cas2 in this complex, which um, was a bit surprising to us because we would have thought Cas1 and Cas2 would always associate with one another. And then this uh, complex can also be purified by size exclusion chromatography, 
Uh, so here we're just separating the proteins based on size. You can see Cas1 and Cas4 elute later, which means that they're smaller, and the Cas4-1 complex elutes earlier, which means that it is larger. So um, we sent a little bit of the sample to collaborators at uh, University of Texas in Austin, David Taylor's lab, and his postdoc Yi Zhu was able to um, solve a really nice uh, um, low resolution but negative stain EM uh, structure of Cas4 and 1. Uh, and what we can see in this structure is that crystal structures of Cas4 fit really beautifully into this yellow and orange density at the top, while Cas1 dimers fit really beautifully into this blue and purple density at the bottom. So what we think uh, we have here is four copies of Cas1, two Cas1 dimers, and two copies of Cas4. And a couple of interesting things here. One is that in the Cas1-2 structure I showed you before, the Cas2 dimer is sandwiched between two Cas1 dimers. So we think this complex may actually be mutually exclusive with the Cas1, Cas2 complex because the two dimers are gonna have to move apart in order to accommodate the Cas2 dimer. All right, so what does this complex do? Or what does Cas4 do, I guess I should say? We can also purify Cas4 on its own. And this alone actually was quite a feat because the reason why we don't know anything about Cas4 is because it's really difficult to work with biochemically. So making the protein up, that alone it has been um, quite, quite, a, quite a beast to deal with, and Hain has managed to overcome that hurdle. So we first looked at whether Cas4 is involved in pre-space or processing. Cas4 is known to be a nuclease. Um, it's thought to be an exonuclease. Uh, so we thought maybe it has something to do with trimming down uh, pre-spacers to make them the correct size for spacer integration. So we use these types of substrates where we have long three prime overhangs uh, to see if it could be cut down to the correct size, 34 base pairs, which is the length of spacers in Bacillus halodurans. And so here I'm just showing you that if we take this substrate, which is labeled on the five prime end, and we incubate it with any of uh, Cas1, 2, <coughs> or 4, or the Cas4, 1 complex, we don't see anything happening to this. Uh, and, and if we then look at Cas1 and Cas2 together, we do see a little bit of processing activity. So Cas1 and 2 alone can process this uh, to some degree. Uh, if we <coughs> knock out the active site residue in Cas1, we no longer see that processing. And then we did the fateful experiment, what if we add Cas4? So if we add Cas4 to this Cas1-2 complex, you can now see that we see a significant enhancement of the cleavage activity. Or if we add the Cas4-1 complex with Cas2, you can also see significant enhancement of the activity. So what this suggests is that the three proteins are working together to enhance the, pro uh, the, the spacer um, cleavage activity. We then did a couple more um, active site re um, mutations. So the K mutation is a mutation in the Cas4 active site. And to our surprise, even though in the Cas1-2 complex we can see some low levels of cleavage, when we make a mutation in the Cas4 active site, we no longer see any cleavage. So somehow, even though Cas1 is capable of uh, pre-spacer pro um, pre processing, it is not in the presence of Cas4, apparently. Uh, whereas when we make the histamine mutations, you can, um, but that when we add Cas4 to the histidine mutation, even though it ablates um, cleavage in the absence of Cas4, we now can rescue cleavage. So what this shows is that Cas4 is necessary and sufficient for uh, cleavage in the Cas4-1-2 complex, the putative Cas4-1-2 complex. Uh, and I just also wanted to show that at lower concentrations of Cas1, we no longer see any cleavage um, by the Cas1-2 complex, but we can still see cleavage when Cas4 is present. I mentioned before that Cas4 is known to be an exonuclease, so you can imagine that what we're seeing is just excess Cas4 in solution trimming the three prime ends of the DNA that are free um, and hanging off of the Cas1-2 complex. So we wanted to see whether this cleavage that we're observing is exonucleolytic or endonucleolytic. And so what we did was we labeled the DNA either on the five prime end or on the three prime end. When we label on the five prime end, we always get the same size product. And again, we see the enhancement of, um, oh, and sorry, we did this for, um, for DNAs that were had different lengths of the overhang sequence. Uh, when we label the 5 end, we always see the same length product and we see enhancement when we add Cas4. 
But when we label the three prime n, we see different length products corresponding to the extra length of the overhang. So what this means is that, is that this is actually endonucleolytic cleavage. It's cleaving at a specific site in the DNA, and it's not just chewing up uh, the, the DNA from the three prime end. So we think that this is good evidence that Cas4 is actually in complex with Cas1 uh, within the complex that's, um, that's cleaving the free spacer. All right, so then we wanted to see whether we can observe first spacer processing and then integration. Can we do it all together? So we took um, a minimal CRISPR, just a long double-stranded DNA that contains the last 10 base pairs of the leader, a repeat, and then a little bit of a spacer. We took a pre-processed protospacer, or uh, pre-processed pre-spacer. And if we get half the integration, we're gonna get a product that looks like this. We denature it, it's gonna be about 66 nucleotides in length. And so with the Cas1-2 complex, we get that nice product. Um, but then if we use an unprocessed um, pre-spacer, so the same pre-spacer that we were using in our processing assay, we don't see much um, integration activity. So now if we add Cas4, we can see um, much more integration activity, especially for the Cas4-1 complex, the, the preformed Cas4-1 complex, even when we use the unprocessed protospacer. So what this means is that the Cas4-1-2 complex is able to process the, the protospace or the pre-spacer and then integrate it into um, the complex. And I want to show this, this is very important, but that K, uh, the active site mutant of Cas4 is capable of integrating pre-processed pre-spacers, but not capable of integrating unprocessed pre-spacers. So we're knocking out the activity of the complex to integrate, uh, to process and then also to integrate. Um, and also the other active site mutants of Cas1, of course, block integration activity altogether. Um, if we do this in a time course assay, what's kind of interesting is that we can initially see unprocessed integration by Cas1 and 2, uh, but at long time points we eventually see that, that being disintegrated, so removed, and then processing and integration occurring. Whereas with the Cas4-1-2 complex, we only see correct integration occurring, so only for processed DNA. So what we think is that Cas4 is helping to ensure that only the correct length spacers are being integrated. Um, so I wanted to also show that we have now some data showing that the complex does integrate, or does uh, have specificity for correct PAM sequences. It only cleaves targets with the correct PAM and not uh, with the reverse PAM or not with the degenerate PAM that doesn't contain the correct PAM sequence. So we think that the complex is, uh, is able to select protospace or pre-spacers based on the PAM sequence. All right, so I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. Uh, we wanted to come up with a high throughput um, assay that would allow us to see where uh, it's being, where um, processed protospacer, pre-spacers are being uh, integrated and then also uh, where they're being processed. Uh, and so we, oops, in this um, diagram, you can see that there's four possible integration um, products. We can um, amplify those using PCR and then submit those products for high throughput sequencing. And so when we did this, uh, actually initially with a, a processed pre-spacer, we could see pretty um, high fidelity integration at the two correct sites. Uh, you can see that the second site, um, the repeat end, is less, um, less specific than the leader end. All 20 of the um, clones that we, that we sequenced here were at the right uh, position. <coughs> When we did this with an unprocessed pre-spacer, and now this is with the high throughput sequencing, um, you can see that again, the leader end is very specific, and now the repeat end, is, or the spacer end, is very non-specific. So what we think this means is that processing is required for correct integration at the, um, at the spacer side of the repeat. Um, and then we also looked at where the processing actually occurs, um, so here you can see that processing on the green strand, this top strand, occurred at the sixth position and processing on the bottom strand occurred at the fourth position. I also want to point out that when we add uh, Cas4, we no longer see very much uh, unprocessed integration, which is con uh, consistent with the previous biochemical results that I showed you. So this is kind of weird. It's kind of, even though the overhangs are identical sequences, it's processing in an asymmetric fashion. 
And um, we had this degenerate sequence in here. Um, we were trying to look at PAMS. Um, I'm not going to really talk about that. But you can see if we move that degenerate sequence, this um, asymmetric processing becomes even more pronounced. So we're quite interested in what that asymmetric processing might mean. We think it may have something to do with how uh, Cascade is able, or um, the co complex is able to orient the spacer during integration. All right, so what I've told you here um, is that the Cas4 active site, I hope I've convinced you, is both necessary and sufficient for pre-spacer processing. Cas4 prevents uh, process spacer or unprocessed spacers from being integrated by Cas1 and Cas2. <coughs> uh, integration occurs specifically at the leader end, but not at the spacer end. Uh, repeat end or spacer end integration specificity is probably dictated by the length of um, the, the pre-spacer, so it has to be fully processed prior to integration. Uh, and then cleavage by the adaptation complex is specific for PAM sequences. And we think maybe that the asymmetric processing may enable differentiation of the PAM end. Um, so we developed a model uh, in which the CAS4-1 complex uh, we think is um, mutually exclusive with the CAS1-2 complex. Uh, and so this might need to dissociate in order to form this full adaptation complex. We're still working on structures of that. We think it then binds to the DNA, and these active sites, which are quite distal from the Cas1 active sites, preferentially bind these three prime ends. And that's how Cas4 is able to prevent Cas1 from cleaving um, the DNA prematurely. <coughs> uh, following this cleavage, the DNA can then switch active sites to the Cas1 active site and then undergo integration first at the leader side Stash is investing. and then at the spacer side. And so with that, thank you for your attention. Sorry, I went uh, five minutes over. But um, I just want to acknowledge my two excellent graduate students, Cha Yu Shui, uh, who worked on the SM Fret stuff, and Haiyun Li, who worked on the CAS4 uh, second part, uh, as well as the rest of my lab, um, and our collaborators in the Shin Lab, who helped with the SM Fret experiments, um, Cha Yu's wife, who did a lot of the computational work on uh, the SM Fret and data analysis, and as I mentioned, David Taylor's lab, who um, did the EM work. And I want to thank our funding. And thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yeah. Any question about the new memories and old memories? Uh -huh. So for the new memories, so you have a cell, a bacterial cell, which is naive to a phage coming to infect it. So that first infection, what leads to the recognition that's not a productive infection that you can actually generate then these these new cassettes? And then the second question is once you are bacteria and you're not exposed to these phages that made up these cassettes for a period of time, is there a machine you did to evict the old ones that are not used? So um, so the first question I understood is um, do you have the phase that just has some deficiency in that yeah. phase in Yeah, so there, there was a paper that showed that um, basically de defective phages are a, a mechanism by which bacteria can take up spacers. That's a, a, a really nice hypothesis for how this could even work in the first place because it's a major question. How is there time for it to take up spacer and elicit the immune response before it's dead? Um, there's also you know the potential for a lysogenic phage um, giving you more time, but then you might be taking up spacers against a prophage that's in your own right. genome, which is probably bad. Uh, so yeah, that is that is definitely one uh, one way that this is thought to occur. It's also been shown recently that most spacers are taken up against the very first DNA that's injected, so the, the end of the DNA that's injected. So that suggests that it's a very fast process that occurs you know, almost simultaneously with infection. Uh, and then your second question was about if you don't older use the spacers. spacers for a long period of time, do you eventually get rid of them? Does the bacteria say we're not using these, so let's not waste the energy to uh -huh. replicate them? Yeah. Um, so a lot of analysis has been done of CRISPR arrays, and most, uh, especially between strains of the same bacteria, um, and it, a lot of the differences occur on the three prime end of the CRISPR, so the the older spacers that are are being lost essentially. Um, and the mechanism of spacer loss, um, we're not really sure exactly how that occurs, but we think that because there's these repeating sequences that it can just occur through replication errors. Um, so if you just have 
you know, some kind of stalled replication fork, it might just skip a spacer or something like that. Um, and we've actually done some experiments in our lab where if we put, have some selective pressure against having a spacer, we can actually get rid of spacers like from the middle of the CRISPR array and it occurs perfectly, you know, you lose one spacer and one repeat, but you don't lose, you know, the entire CRISPR is still intact. So it's pretty cool that that somehow works. With, we don't exactly know how. <laughs> I, I saw your hand first. Cas makes a vital system binds to DNA and then it is detected by spread, right? So yeah. it also leads to the conformational change. So how do you detect the con specific conformational change of the target? We have not yet. Oh, sorry, the conformational change of the target? Yeah, in, in vivo. Um, so the target, the DNA conformational change we haven't detected. Um, other people have done fraud experiments where they have the two fluorophores on either strand of the DNA and they can see that, you know, basically when the DNA is unwound, you have a loss of threat signal or a, a decrease in threat signal. Um, we just made the assumption that when um, we see a long-lived fret, it's because uh, cascade is bound to the target. Um, if it was, you know, some kind of transient event, then it's most likely because the DNA wasn't fully unwound. Um, in terms of conformational changes of the complex, we're actually working on that. Now we want to do SM fret where we can, instead of looking at cascade binding to the DNA, we can actually look at conformational changes in cascade as it's binding to the DNA. So that's what we're working on now. Oh, so in the latter part of the talk, you were looking at processing the three spacer sequences. It, it looks like you always had single stranded ends, yeah. but I don't remember the reason why you went with single um, I didn't have time to show the data, but we tried um, fully double stranded and five prime overhangs and single stranded. Uh, and uh, with single-stranded DNA, it does have exonucleolytic activity. I think with the double-stranded DNA, blunt double-stranded DNA, it had exonucleolytic activity at very high concentrations. Um, but, and we couldn't tell if that was just a, um, a contaminant or not. Uh, with the five prime overhangs, it didn't have any activity. Uh, but with the three prime overhangs, it does. And it's been previously shown that Cas1 and 2 have a preference for this type of substrate where there's a three prime overhang. So how those are actually generated in vivo is still an open question. Um, there's some thoughts that the RecBCD um, uh, products are single stranded and they could potentially re anneal to each other. And similarly, some interference products like the products of the type one system would also be single stranded, so potentially could re anneal or that might be facilitated in some manner, or there might be some completely different mechanism to make the spacers in the first uh, place. So that's still a major open question, I would say. How are the how are those pre-spacers formed in the first place? Okay, well, we've gone long, so um, I think we should probably stop the questions here. Thank you.